welcome back to part two, if you like, of today's session. And um, it provides me with enormous uh, pleasure, great pleasure, to introduce my former colleague, but great friend, Professor Giovanna Michelot, who, will, who is a sustainability accounting uh, and sustainability reporting uh, expert, I would say. And um, she's going to speak today on empathy. Yeah. And um, you see the, the, the reflections of the scholarly role of academic empathy. So without further ado, over to Javan. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, John and Kevin and Bafla for inviting me today. It's a pleasure. Um, so the reason why I chose this topic is not just because I brought the commentary on this, but also because I'm I'm here also on behalf of the European Accounting Association, and I think some of the things we are doing over there kind of overlap, and I also thought it fit well, fit well with what uh, Jen talked about this morning. And so um, I'm going to mix a bit of scholarly work with some promotion about the European Accounting Association, but I'll do it in a very subtle way so you won't even notice it. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, where the idea came from, what it is, um, why do we care about academic empathy, if at all, and if we do, how do we develop it? And so um, <coughs> the idea actually started about five years ago um, at a European Accounting Association Congress where Yves Gedron and Michel Rodrigue had a panel on the um, boundary of accounting research, and then they went on writing a paper for critical perspective on accounting, and I was invited to write a commentary. So before I talk about my commentary, I just want to summarize the four points that Eve and Michelle bring forward in their research. Um, they essentially um, acknowledge that the boundary of accounting research vary in time and in space. Um, and then they also recognize that this boundary is socially constructed and um, there are certain players, which um, they call the gatekeeper, gatekeepers, that affect the dynamic between the center of the discipline and the periphery of the discipline. Um, and to them, when um, boundary gatekeeping is too tight, uh, this can create some negative problems because it may hinder the level of innovativeness of our research because essentially everybody look at few journals and what they're publishing on and so young scholars get somehow influence about what it is that they want to research about because they see what's um, appearing and being published in top journals. And so they promote this idea of boundary permeability, uh, which would allow uh, for research to take place at the periphery of our discipline and therefore um, grant innovation in the discipline. Um, so, you know, when I was asked to write a commentary, I always uh, start off when I write papers with very big ideas that I never then um, answer or address in my papers, but I, I do a little tiny bit. And so one question I was concerned about, if it is true that we have this problem that we are hindering innovation in the discipline, um, are, we really, are we really conceiving as scholars, are we conceiving accounting research as sustainable? And I was so happy to see tomorrow you have a panel on this. Um, so, you know, it's all related there. And so if we want to move um, a country on research forward, how do we do this? And also, how do we make sure that what we do ultimately does respond to a public interest, not just to our own career goals, if you want. Um, and so in my commentary, I cover uh, four aspects, and it is in the last aspect down there that I talk about academic empathy. Um, I sort of agree with uh, uh, Michelle and Eve that accounting research boundaries vary in time and in space, but I also think they vary um, in terms of um, some accounting scholars really not wanted or wanted to publish outside of accounting, and Jen this morning was uh, a very good example of how accounting research boundaries may vary, um, and in a sense, the way in which we think of boundaries shouldn't be done with respect to time and space, but more in terms of the question we ask ourselves, um, you know, the vocabulary, the terminologies that we use, the literature we drawn upon. As Jen pointed out this morning, some of you um, think of accounting as a, an economic 
uh, driven or based kind of discipline, other think more of organizational studies and sciences. Um, there are different methods, different um, journals we publish in, um, but to a certain extent, depending on your formation or where you stand and what you like to investigate, um, you think of the center of a discipline in a very different way. So what I try to argue is that accounting doesn't have one center, it has multiple centers, and these essentially start off from where you see yourself, in which subfield, if you wish, of accounting you see yourself. And by having multiple centers, we also means we have different trajectories toward the periphery. Um, and so, you know, uh, my argument here is that we don't really have one center, but it's multiple. And uh, what we conce conceive um, research at the periphery also varies. Now, why, are, why do we have boundaries? Uh, in the first place. So, you know, why do we worry about what accounting is or what accounting research is? And I think that's related to the fact that each discipline needs to build an identity. And the only way to build an identity in the scientific uh, world, you sort of need a discipline which, 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 to which you belong and refer to. But another interesting aspect of this um, boundary making to um, differentiate yourself from other disciplines um, is also the recognition that pretty much each single discipline does have intradisciplinary divides. So the, what Jen referred to different perspectives, um, that's a nice world, often there are more divides because we really see the world in different ways. Um, and the way in which uh, we see the world, perhaps we don't realize it, but it does uh, we do so because we have a, a different ideology compared to, to some other colleagues. Um, and obviously, um, I don't think ideologies are always compromisable or uh, you can have intersection, but it's important to be aware of this. Um, and so to me, the, um, the role of gatekeepers, uh, which Eve and Michelle sort of emphasize a lot in their paper, um, has to deal more with players who are protecting the dominant center within a discipline, what you would call the mainstream accounting. Uh, and it's called mainstream because it's what most of us do, um, and it's also what we actually see in the most influential journals, if you wish. Um, and so gate, the gatekeeping activities, um, in a sense, um, are, are, are creating some problems. And more than hindering innovation, I think what worries, concerns me the most is that they have um, introduced a level of competition in academia, what I think of academia very much as a collaborative environment rather than a competitive one. Um, it's not that if I publish, then you should not publish. Um, and it's also distorted a little bit uh, the way in which we think about research. So the ambition now is to get published in TAR, JAR, JE, or AOS, rather than thinking about what are research questions that we really care about, you know, how do we do, how do we investigate in a rigorous way, and then the journal where you publish, it's an important aspect, but it shouldn't be somehow the, the, the main worry about, um, about the research that you do. And of course, it's easy for me to say so, because I'm a full professor, um, and I have here a young audience that will have to go through um, career progression, and we know the university often use rankings and, and this is part of the gatekeeping system that, that I'm more concerned about. Um, but then I'm, I'm an optimistic person, um, and I'm also Italian, and boundaries in Italian has two meanings. In English, they, they, you, need, you use two different words. Um, you use uh, boundaries or frontiers. So boundaries are there because we have divides, um, but we can think of these boundaries also as frontiers. And what, what are frontiers? Um, frontiers are essentially a border, right? Um, a confine, that's the Italian word, between what you know and what you do not know. Um, and so what uh, even and Michelle were talking about is the most innovative research, it's probably happening away from the center of the discipline. That's what they call the centrality of peripheral research. But in a sense, this is not a new idea. It's, it's frontier research. Now, here you have four bullet points that describe what frontier research is. These are not 
my own idea what frontier research is, but is what the European Commission um, defined as frontier research. They did so when they launched their big research investment program back in 2005. And so frontier research is really about new knowledge or developing a new understanding on, of social phenomenon. Um, it's, it's a risk activity. What, what does risk mean? It means that not all the avenues for research that you are going um, to start may prove fruitful. Um, so there is, there is um, a risk of, of losing something there. And then what is really interesting to me, it's, it's not just about new knowledge, but also it's about useful knowledge, okay? So essentially it's putting research um, at the service of, of our society um, to try and, and have more applied, I guess, uh, implication of what we do. And then it's frontier research when it's dealing with questions that are um, irrespective of the established disciplinary boundaries. So it's, it's really research that is multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. And I think this is, you know, at least in the front end of uh, research um, agencies, um, so the, the European Commission, but also I guess in this country, they look for interdisciplinary research. Um, and I think this is quite an important thing because um, if we think about our accounting field, you know, if you didn't hear Jan this morning, do you think we could actually produce frontier research? And I'm not being sarcastic or, you know, ironic. I'm really genuinely interested. Can we say that most of the accounting research that, that we produce is frontier research, given the definition that I've just um, provided? Um, in a sense, um, It seems that frontier research is asking us to consider what are um, the key um, challenges that we are um, facing as a society um, and try to, to address them. Um, and it's about um, thinking um, of research that um, speaks to um, what we know, not just within our discipline, but also what's happening outside of the discipline. Um, there have been some commentary in, I mean, in a, so on one sense, we have this view that accounting research may be stagnant um, it, with respect to the definition I've just said. But I also, at the same time, I want to recognize that it's not true because accounting research is very diverse and lively. The point is, if you read three journals, um, and they're all mainstream journals, you're gonna think of research there being a bit stagnant or at least moving in waves. If you look at the plethora of accounting journals that we have, or you read what accounting scholars write even outside accounting journal, then you cannot really say it's stagnant. Um, and so here I have a bit of, of a positive view, but the point is that when we reflect on our discipline, we have to acknowledge that the discipline is not just what's happening in the center around us, but we need also to recognize that within our discipline, there are people doing things very different from what we do. Um, and, and sometimes these things um, get lost. And I'm gonna give you an example. Um, I'm assuming you are familiar with that movie called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, where the guy's aging reverse. Um, Everybody right now is talking about ESG, is talking about sustainability. Of course, there have been a series of institutional events and regulations that are bringing this to the forefront of investors' agenda, and therefore, by definition, they have become at the forefront of those accounting scholars that look at investor behavior and understand how information fits in investor decisions. Um, but it's not a new area. I mean, it's not a new era. And so, uh, you know, you sometimes see these papers being published in very prestigious journals and you're asking yourself, yes, but 
you know that perhaps 20 years ago, AAAJ had published something on this, or the Journal of Business Ethics, or Accounting Forum. And, and it's not just me sort of stepping in because I'm doing sustainability accounting. I just feel like the discipline is not necessarily progressing um, if we don't recognize um, a bulk of research that has been conducted, especially in Europe and Australia, not so much perhaps in North America. But that's, that's part of the scientific base on which we need to build the future of sustainability accounting, or if you want to call it ESG. And so these are two um, very good scholars, a lot better than I am, that kind of you know, um, discuss how the discovery of CSR research in North America can be assimilated to what Columbus did. Um, you know, he did, he, the United, well, the, 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 the North America was there before Columbus went, but he discovered it. Um, and then uh, dear Jeff, Jeffrey um, wrote a piece for British Accounting Review, in fact, um, criticizing a little bit a systematic literature review conducted by two North American scholars um, that somehow omitted um, uh, all the relevant journals that have been published in sustainability accounting research till then. Um, so what I'm trying to get is if we really want to move research forward, I don't think gap spotting um, really works because sometimes either we don't know very well um, the journals in our discipline or we don't know all of them, um, but also because you know, it's important to understand whether other scholars in other disciplines may have perhaps investigated this issue and the fact that you do not acknowledge that perhaps impairs a little bit the, the scientific base on which you build your paper. And the other issue is, and I think Jan <laughs> really provided a good example, if we want to try and address today's challenges, especially when it comes to sustainability, um, we can't do that on our own. Um, the problems that we are facing call for an interdisciplinary co condition. Um, you know, we need to, to sort of uh, move through uh, an academic subject to understand and address the problem um, and do that with, the other, with, the, with other disciplines so that we can get to the other side. Um, and, and this is where I perhaps pose this a bit of a provocation question. Um, perhaps we should just let go of, of disciplines and methods and think about how we could organize research in topics and questions. And again, uh, sorry if I keep calling Jenna, but I think my subconscious was thinking of what she was doing when I wrote this commentary with the CBOS initiative, which I was aware about. And in a sense, this is, um, this is to me uh, the, way, the way forward. Now, um, let's try to, to sort of get into academic empathy because I still haven't talked about it. Um, so I think one step to move, move us forward um, is to keep in mind that uh, as social scientists, we do make certain assumptions. And sometimes um, we are so much into them that we don't realize that we're making them. And we come, become, they become granted. And, and we essentially live in this default setting um, um, that becomes almost self-referential at times. And, 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 and this is because we are not willing to really put ourselves outside of our comfort zone and question uh, the underlying assumption that we are sort of making. And that's where I propose that academic empathy could help us overcome this problem. Um, and so while Michelle and Eve talk about fuzzy research boundary, I talk about caring connection within our disciplines and across disciplines. And empathy in, in the normal language really is about taking the perspective of somebody else without really judging what that person is doing. There is an element of recognizing emotion that I don't think it's so relevant in the academic uh, side of empathy. And then being able to communicate that understanding. And so you can think of it as, um, being able to see the world through the eyes of intellectual frameworks that do not belong to you, um, which is not an easy thing to do, 
because obviously you, you're sort of recognizing that there may be somebody else in your discipline that acknowledged another truth as a different ideology, ideology from, um, from yours or a different uh, perspective. Um, and the other thing that why it is so hard is that it does require you to understand a little bit of what um, the other academic is doing. And so when I ask uh, Jen the question, how did you, you know, start um, learning about these other disciplines and what they were doing, it, it's that effort of getting out of your comfort zone and, you know, go to conferences that you don't feel you belong to, understand what others are saying. And this is true within the discipline and also when you want to embrace um, something else, some other uh, work. Um, Yeah, and I think this, the, the understanding of another center or another discipline is really important. Um, academic can be aggressive, but they can also be very defensive when they feel they are attacked. And one way to overcome that, perhaps even emotional thing, is to have some basic reciprocal understanding. I think BAFA is doing a great job in terms of research diversity with these events and even the conference. And, you know, but, but you live in a, in a very special world and I would invite you to attend the American Accounting Association for once in your life and you will see that, that diversity that you see here in terms of research ideas and subfields of the disciplines, it's not there. Um, and, and, and if you are a PhD student, being formed in the United States, uh, pretty much following a positivist paradigm that is economic space, you don't even know um, that there are certain accounting scholars that may be seeing the world in a very different way from you. You are not aware of that. Um, now, academic empathy is not <laughs> a justification, you know, when your papers get rejected. Um, and if, if the paper gets rejected, it's not necessarily because the editor is not empathic. Uh, it, it may be because you don't have a good paper or you got the wrong journal or whatever. Um, and it's not even about, let's try to reconcile different views, the walls of different methodology. It's more like a dialogue. It's, it's about um, talking about our ideas and our views and building from there. It's to think about agreement rather than differences. And then, you know, for some, it will be possible to build bridges, and for others, it won't be possible. And we just recognize that and, and move on. Um, now, why do I think academic empathy may be important? I'll, I'll give you two examples. One is personal, and one is not personal, but I was involved in it. Um, so I have a PhD in economics and management. So I have been doing quants since I was a PhD student. And I never knew there was something as called qualitative research in accounting until um, I stubbornly wanted to do social environmental accounting research and I stumbled into the Center for Social Environmental Accounting Research in St. Andrews and I started to hang out with that crowd. And I realized I was a minority. I was, um, you know, I was doing quants in a world of people that were doing very different research compared to mine, and I didn't even have the tools to understand whether it was good or bad. Um, and so it, it, it was that feeling of really not, I'm not comfortable here, I don't, you know, I'm, it's not that I'm not comfortable, but I need, I want to be comfortable because at the time they were the only guys that were interested in doing what I was doing. Um, and so I really wanted to stick with them, right? Um, and that uh, taught me a lot. I mean, I wouldn't say that I am a qualitative research whatsoever, but if anything, I've learned how to appreciate uh, what we can learn from alternative methods, what we, can, what we can understand when we don't have a functionalist view of the world and we think, you know, that it's um, subject, it's individualized its own interpretation. And I think, you know, if I'm here today talking about this, perhaps something good it has done to me. Um, on another, more uh, broader context. I think academic empathy is important when we enter policy debates as academics. Um, and especially given the, the ecological crisis that we're going through, I don't think we have um, time nor space to, um, you know, uh, play who's right or is wrong. We need really to put an effort together. 
Um, in, in, at the end of 2020, the IFRS Foundation uh, launched that consultation paper that was proposing the formation of the International Sustainability Standard Board. Um, and there was one particular, uh, a lot of things that we were worried about, but one particular problem we had was this idea of calling sustainability reporting as addressing the investors' needs and therefore focusing on that on a financial materiality perspective, which is the last slide um, Jan presented. So essentially what they were saying, oh, now there is another issue is called sustainability that is affecting firm performance, and so we need to create standards um, so that companies can prepare sustainability reports that inform investors. You know, if you look at sustainability reports before the I IFRS Foundation came out, weren't really conceived for investors, were conceived um, for stakeholders more, more broadly. And so we were alarmed. We wrote a letter, an open letter, that created a bit of um, um, an emotional reaction here and there. Um, and so Matthias uh, Lane and myself wrote, and this is where I'm uh, talking about the European Accounting Association very subtly, we wrote a blog on the Accounting Research Center website explaining why we felt the need um, to sort of um, wrote, write that letter that we did. Uh, the letter is also available. Um, it's uh, Carol Adams was in it. And it created some reaction. The president of the European Accounting Association, Thorsten Seldon, also wrote there. Um, there are more papers, some, some of them are less empathic, but really what happened there was that the European Accounting Association um, sort of entered in the conversation trying to fuel this caring connection I was talking about in an effort to understand why was there a group of scholars that was so much upset about what the IFRS Foundation was doing? Because that was not something they would understand if they didn't know what we kind of uh, knew. And so we organized uh, a workshop um, with the IFRS, and we had Carol Adams and Richard Becker sort of presenting the, uh, the two opposing points of view. And from there, we also started organizing a series of dialogues which we call academic empathy dialogue. Now, I am I'm not delusional of grandeur. Um, it was Thorsten's idea to call them academic empathy dialogues. Um, but in a sense, it w it, it, I think it's been a good, um, a good, a good thing. We, we essentially bring scholars that come from this different epistemological standing, and we have a mediator, and we have a discussion. And so the one sustainability reporting was um, held in January with John, Hans Christensen, and Robin Roberts, but we also had one on narrative reporting with Neve and Bill and Steve Young. Um, and all of them are available on the Accounting Research Center. So uh, you can watch them if you haven't attended them. Um, so what for, you know, for junior schoolers, wh wh where do we go? Um, I'm, um, I mean, that piece of advice that I would give uh, a young scholar is uh, do the research you're passionate uh, about and not just what you see as trending in influential journals. Um, I mean, <laughs> the job is tough itself, so if you don't do what you're passionate about, you, you can get very tired very soon. Um, be curious and read widely. So again, I'm, I'm sure nobody in this room only reads JAR, TAR, and JE, but if you did, you would have a very, um, partial view of what accounting research is, I believe. And so I, you know, I, I encourage you to read widely, even outside the discipline. Um, get out of your comfort zone, you know, try to learn as you do research. Um, learn new things, not, not just how to do, do a, a, um, a well-designed uh, uh, piece of research. Um, keep in mind that the way in which you approach your research questions um, is related to the way in which you see the world, and so this is something you need to be aware about. Um, as you move out of your PhD um, program, trying to find the right institution for you, uh, meaning an institution that sort of can uh, fit well with your desires and, and research ambitions. Um, be respectful of alternative paradigms, whether you are a mainstream scholar, but even if you are a critical scholar, there's no need to say that all mainstream research is bad, because I don't think it is. 
Um, you know, Copernicus and Galileo in their times were not exactly mainstream. They had a bit of an issue at the time, but still they were right. So, um, and then yes, continue to seek opportunities for people that are different from you. Do not always stick to your own um, crowd. Um, now, given that the audience does have some more senior members, perhaps um, you know, there is also something that we can do. Um, you know, for some of us, training um, may be too, too late, but perhaps not. Uh, you know, Jen, Jen retrained herself to you know, work with ecologists and sustainability scientists, so we can all do it. Um, yeah, we, you know, when we design our units or we uh, think about research that informs our teaching, uh, let's be aware that we can grant information from the broad spectrum of the, the research paradigms. Um, in the PhD programs, I think it's important that we discuss uh, the, the epistemology assumption of, of our research a lot. Um, Involve, get involved in the associations, uh, trying to promote diversity and, and empathy, and that's the reason why I guess I'm involved in the European Accounting Association, because there was a bit of a feeling that the European Accounting Association was becoming very similar to the American one, and we didn't want to lose that diversity, but, but it takes time and, and, and energy to do that. Um, this is another bit of hidden advertising. Uh, you know, think about journals that um, support and promote diversity. Accounting Forum and Accounting Business Research are two examples. I'm sure there are many more, like Bar. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so that's what I, I can say. Um, so to me, academic empathy is really this ability of, um, you know, putting yourself in, in, in a different, an alternative paradigm and see things from within there rather than with your eyes. And it reminds me a lot of what Picasso was doing with his Cubist paintings, right? He would see different perspectives and he would put them together. And so to me, a little bit, this is what um, academic empathy is about. Um, I do have one last slide that is more explicitly about the, the EAA. Um, so the EAA, like the BAFA, does have a doctoral colloquium. Um, the, the submission deadlines is always at the end of November, um, and then the colloquium takes place where the Congress takes place. Um, there is also uh, what they call a talent workshop, which is really a job market, so an opportunity for institution to meet candidates, and it has been um, held virtually, obviously, in the past two years, but otherwise takes place in November in Madrid. Uh, you see more information on the EA Line website. Um, the EAA also has what it's called a peer mentoring initiative. So this is for students who are writing up the research proposal. You can submit it and get feedback from anonymous scholars um, uh, and in, in the sort of the development stage rather than at the end. And then we have virtual events for the junior network where usually we host an editor of a journal um, for question and answer after a short pre presentation. But we do have many um, virtual events and things that we do, um, and those two are the website that I refer you to if you want to learn more. Thank you, that's it. Well, thank you, uh, Giovanna. Um, may I ask if there's any questions from the audience? And if we've got a rolling mic. Any chance? Questions for Giovanna? Oh, Stuart's on the case. <laughs> so I think there's one right at the front. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Henny Gunawan. I'm from Harriet Watt University. So my question is, uh, you speak about the interdisciplinary uh, research. So I am actually in uh, that type of research as well. So um, as you know that when as a reviewer or as somebody who uh, doing like uh, reviewing our papers, uh, how is the approach when it's only purely financing compared if it's like a mix of financing and other disciplines? Like how that, uh, is there any normalizations in terms of how you review it 
uh, of the result that a, a student will give accordingly. Um, are you a finance you. scholar or are you an accounting scholar? Finance or accounting? Finance. Um, I think finance is slightly different from accounting and in that regard, um, from my understanding of the finance field. Um, it's a bit more monoparadigmatic um, than it is, uh, than accounting is. But I think a lot of accounting scholars really do finance research or the other way around, so they're very close. I don't know the finance journal well enough to tell you which journals would be open to sort of intradisciplinary -dis work, but the Journal of Business, Finance and Accounting has finance and accounting there, so I'm assuming it would be a journal that, uh, you know, where reviewers are open to that. Um, but it also depends whether you're talking about interdisciplinary work that is alternative paradigms compared to the main one or not. In which case I wouldn't have the answer because I don't know the finance field well enough. I'm just thinking like a very general question because it's like when you review it, it's not purely financing because you also uh, put another di disciplines into that research. So as a reviewer, will you uh, review it in the same way just uh, by well, comparing with pure financial. I mean, and, and, and that's where I'm, I'm arguing that academic empathy is very much an individual scholar kind of characteristic. So if I was a reviewer um, of a paper that was interdisciplinary, I would pay attention to this, but I don't know if everybody does that. That, that I, I can tell. I don't think it's normalized necessarily, but I think in accounting there are a lot of journals that would be okay with identifying the right reviewers for that type of paper. Oh. I only did that to make you run. Jivarna, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I just wonder, um, because you have a lot of involvement with the European Accounting Association, if you compare I hope this is an okay question to ask you, but if you compare the UK with Europe out there, uh, are we short on uh, empathy or are we topped up as far as we can go? Um, no, I, I have to say, um, and of course I'm, I, I'm aware of the European Accounting Association, I'm aware of the Italian Accounting Association and, and definitely to me the, the, the BAFA is a lot more diverse and inclusive um, and, and I think you can see that from the sessions that you have today, but also in, in the reminder. Um, so perhaps I am preaching to the converted, but still there is a lot of pressure on UK institutions with rankings and, and top journals. And compared to when I came to the UK nine years ago, I've seen quite a shift in, in several institutions <laughs> towards this sort of you know, it matters if it is in the top three or in the top five, otherwise it's not worth even publishing it. And, and obviously it's not the case, and we as senior scholars need to make sure that doesn't happen um, too much. Thank you very much. Um, my, my is more of a reflection. I think that I wanted to ask this question when Jan, Jan was doing her, her section as well. Um, Obviously, this audience, we've got a, a few senior colleagues and legends. You know, I can see Lisa, Trevor, Andy, and, and John, and many others here. But mostly, this, this audience is early career. We are mostly early career or PhD students. And doing in, in this type of research, I mean, certainly where John ended is the future. I, I agree with that. But doing this type of research is challenging in a number of ways. It's, it's quite difficult to do, you know, it requires a lot of effort into this. But also, there are a lot of barriers, you know. I think the question that uh, the lady over there was asking about the review process, for example, how is the review process handled handle this type of papers? The effort that goes into writing this, these type of papers, you know, you publish in the, in the Nature, which is a top science journal, but how will the senior colleagues receive it if you, if, you were, if you were a junior academic and you started. So my, my question is, not, it's not a question, but what, what, what are your reflections? Maybe other senior colleagues can also uh, contribute to this on how to negotiate this. We know this is the future, 
but we know that also that immediately it's difficult to do. Obviously, this is not Giovanna, right? 2022, this is somebody starting right now. What are some of the reflections on this? Practically, how can they do this? How can we do this? Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I have an answer. As I said, when I did my PhD in the early 2000s, I wanted to do social environmental reporting. And I remember my supervisor telling me, what is this? You know, what? Um, and, and, you know, despite that, I, I just thought it, this was what I cared about. And so, you know, I think as a junior scholars, the important thing is that you do what you care about. And it could be, you know, a mainstream accounting. I'm, 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 you know, you, you may be interested in understanding how information, you know, fits um, uh, pricing mechanism or informs investor decision. I'm not saying this is bad or wrong at all, um, but just do... The important thing is that you do it because you care, you are interested in it, and not because it's what may get you published in, in a top journal. Um, so as a, you know, right now I think junior colleagues should just focus on what they are passionate about. Um, that, that's my advice. And then eventually it will turn out in, in, in a good thing, I, I think. Hi, Andy Stark from uh well, nowhere actually, I think. <laughs> Absolutely, retired, unattached. Um, <clears throat> Giovanna, I, I, I agree entirely with what you say. I mean, I came up doing a PhD in, well, let's just say many years ago. And, and I, I had an epistemology course from the much feared Richard Whitley, who, who Trevor will know. And um, it's safe to say that although I'm a quants type researcher, uh, I don't think there are any numbers in this particular course. And I, one of my colleagues accused me of writing the Daily Mirror's version of, um, of epistemology when I tried to make any sense of this. I remember thinking about Talcott Parsons and goodness knows who. Uh, but I survived. <clears throat> I think what you said, I, I, I think the change in academic society from then to now, and Trevor also can comment upon this, is almost entirely correlated, and I, I'm not too sure whether I want to say cause and effect, I don't know whether I've done a difference in differences analysis yet <laughs> on this, but um, it's entirely caused by changes in incentives over time. And I speak as a journal editor now. JBFA suddenly became an A-star journal in Australia What's your prediction yeah. as to how many submissions we'd get from, from Australia, yeah. New Zealand, and anywhere else influenced by the ABDC list? Well, we went up 50% in, uh, in terms of submissions, and we can observe where we believe there are pockets of people and institutions that are switching over to the ABDC, thinking that's a more reasonable way of trying to look at attainment uh, than, than using than using the ABS. So, it's incentives. We respond to personal incentives, so we do what we do. If we're lucky, we get to, a, we get to an old age. And you see this in America too, where people having worked pretty hard doing so-called mainstream research, which outside of America, I would argue, is not mainstream at all. In other words, it's your sort of work it's more sociologically based, politically based that's mainstream. It's not market based work that's mainstream. But they get to the stage where they think, I don't want to do this anymore, for, for the reasons that, that are being actually enunciated. And then they start changing a little, not a lot. But we do what we have to do. And incentives vary. If you work at, well, I talk about a friend, friends of mine work at Maryland. Okay, the accounting review, JE and JAR count, RAST, CAR doesn't count, don't count. In other words, it's not just the ABS four rated journals. Management science does count, blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of things that do and don't count. And it depends upon the incentives. If your university is heavily, in, or your business school is heavily influenced by the FT list, you will go by the FT list. Because what the dean wants is to be high up in the 
high up in the FT, in the FT ranking. So that's what people, and, and institutions are entirely entitled to have their own strategies and not be responsible for some more, some more broader notion of the public interest and scholarship. But it does emphasize, I think, what you say, Giovanna, pick your institution. Yeah. Don't assume that, uh, don't go to London Business School no. and want to publish in AOS. Well, no. actually, actually, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get an interview <laughs> because they'd look at you and say no. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, um, it's something you have to think about very, very carefully. Institutions, journals, what you want. It isn't just a question of finding a job. It is a question of trying. And it, it then means that when you start your PhD, you've got to have a plan for your labour market entry. In other words, you don't start thinking about that when you've done your PhD and hope for the best. You've had to be thinking about it right from the start, thinking, where might I like to work and what do I have to do? Which then means you've just got to do an awful lot of work into the, uh, the ecology, I suppose, would be... Of course, coming out of my mouth, that's probably a bit... Uh, <laughs> People will think I'm spitting teeth. But, but the ecology of the world in which you live, the, the, the sort of the whole organizational structure is very complex and is very important, however, to understand right from the start. Anyway. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Andy and I do very different research, but we actually come out of a very similar stable. Uh, I first met you when uh, Tony Lowe you used to come over to Sheffield, where all the accounting heretics uh, were residing at the time. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, incentives are important, we, we can't deny them, but I think often research deans tell you unrealistic expectations I mean, if you're going to be publishing annually in a A-star journal, you're going to be a professor in a few years. And, uh, you know, be, be realistic. Uh, but just to give a bit of a, a history lesson here, um, it's interesting there's been so much talk about sustainable development. But, uh, when David Cooper and I did the first IPA conference, we had to decide what fell within our remit of interdisciplinary. And we weren't sure about what was then called social environmental accounting. And we thought, well, they're pretty well-meaning people. <laughs> um, perhaps we ought to include them. And there's only a few people doing it. Uh, uh, David Owen uh, and Rob Gray. obviously uh, Gray, Rob Gray. And, uh, and stuff. Uh, now it, it's mainstream. Um, yeah, but, but I disagree. I mean... It's not the same thing. Um, main, sorry, I'm, I'm yeah. a bit pickier, but when you hear about ESG reporting and, and what I see, it's another variable that is being looked at because it may inform capital market decision. I don't, I don't see a great level of innovativeness, nor I see um, an understanding of what ESG or sustainability reporting is about. I don't uh, see that. You see, you see it published, but I wouldn't say that that research is particularly mind-blowing. Well, I think that's another story of how uh, certain approaches in accounting have, uh, have taken over the, this agenda. But, but I mean, when I started, I mean, even doing what was then called behavioral accounting, you know, I was told, this isn't accounting. Uh, and a lot of, I think, of our, our, our careers, really, and you're absolutely correct here, is actually looking at work in other disciplines and importing it and, and applying it yeah. to accounting. And going back to journals, I, I mean, basically, I, I, I just published in journals that were sympathetic and would publish uh, my work. Uh, at the time, a lot of them weren't highly rated, AOS wasn't highly rated. CPA wasn't. Ma, uh, oh, blimey, I, I have an effect, don't I? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Journal rankings change. And I think they're in the process. I agree with uh, Andy here. They're in the process of changing internationally. Um, 
I think sometimes there's a bit of culture cringe to, to, to so-called leading American journals. So uh, I actually have some sympathy with you. You've got to feel passionate about what you want to do. Uh, if you don't, you might as well get an, a, a more highly paid job outside academia. Agreed. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think we should perhaps close there, but I'd like to thank sure, both thank Jan and Giovanna for fantastic presentations. And we've got a little something. Okay. No. No. Can we just, um, oh, thanks. This is not really it. Oh, thank you. Okay, do I have to oh. open it? Sorry? Do I have to no, open no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the only la the last thing I'd say as well is um, just to wrap this, I suppose, is, you know, you can change. And, yeah. uh, you know, my PhD was in auditing. I haven't written an auditing paper for quite a few years now. I'm more financial accounting. And you can also move. And I say that having stayed for a long time at one university and then deciding at the start of the pandemic it was time to move universities. <laughs> Which, despite the fact that my mum and my dad and my sister and my brother-in-law, my cousin, and everybody said, you are mental, why are you moving? You're giving, if, if all this goes to part, you'll get no payoff. You know, if universities close down, it's, but it can reinvigorate you. So if you happen to be in a university that changed, is that fair to say? And bring in the metrics that Andy was speaking about, um, you can always move. It's not scary. There's loads of other choices, and it's a great field to be in. Anyway, thank you, Javan.